All right, good morning, everybody. Um, so I think we'll, we'll try and get started. Uh, just before we get into the actual meat of the event, um, the, we're obviously on the, on the second floor here. Um, in the event of an emergency, the exits are straight out through there, and there's actually a staircase at the other end uh, that we would head to, and then the uh, hotel staff would, uh, would direct us from there. Um, I'd also make mention of the fact that uh, we are actually recording the first part of this process. So the, the actual slide presentation was actually going to be recorded, so it will be available to those certificates who are unable to make it or to be here today. Um, but at that point, when we actually sort of move into the second half, which is more of the discussion piece, we'll, we'll actually turn off the cameras. So, uh, my name's Kevin Dawson. I'm the uh, current past chair of the BCRSP. And uh, like I assume the majority of the people here, I'm also a certificate, so I'm, I'm 981221. For those who watch uh, or are fans of movies and things like that, uh, everybody has a number, and some people remember that number forever. This happens to be one of those numbers that I will always remember for, for some reason. Um, what I'm going to try and do to here today is basically our agenda is um, the first half hour or so, half hour, 40 minutes, I ha I've put together a rel relatively short uh, PowerPoint that talks about the basic concepts that we're trying to get across here at this point in time, where we sit, um, what's developed over the past year, et cetera and where we think perhaps things are going in the next year, in, you know, for, for 2020. Once we've finished that piece, uh, then I'm just going to be quiet to a certain extent, open up the, the discussion to the floor. The other purpose for us doing this event is to get feedback from you so that we have a feeling to, uh, as to what, what you as certificates feel is important, where the roadblocks might be, where things might need to be tweaked, etc. Because, as you'll see as we get further on into the presentation, the, um, the next step in this process is actually when you're mov we're moving out into wider consultation, not necessarily with stakeholders, but with, or sorry, with certificates, but with much larger st stakeholder groups. Like, like industry associations, et cetera. We've done some of that, but this would be a much larger process. So it doesn't really make sense for us to put huge amounts of time and effort into that next year if there's a general feeling that the whole concept of what we're talking about just doesn't make sense or it's not a good idea. Um, one of the concepts that I'd like to stress right up the front is I'm going to be talking quite a little bit about the, the idea of a role. And the reason why we're using that term is because in the context of what we're talking here, there are roles. There are roles for individuals and there are roles for organizations. Um, so in the concept that we're talking about, or in that context, as I said, most of you who are here are certificants. But in addition to that, I would suspect that most of you are uh, employees or owners of, of organizations or part of organizations. You're also perhaps members of, of organizations such as the CSSE or other professional bodies. And some of you actually also may be registrants or license holders. So when I use the term role, please bear in mind that it could mean, it could be, uh, it could be relevant to you in either of the contexts that I just used. It's, it's not an exclusive type of thing. It's, it, it's something that can fit across uh, uh, individuals and organizations. So who are we? I would suspect that almost everybody in this room knows this piece. But basically, one of the reasons why I'm showing this slide is to get into this discussion of role. We're the BCRSP. 
We've been around since uh, 1976. We have a governing board, as you all know. All of those, or the majority of the individuals on that board, we have one public member and we have uh, one individual who's actually a staff person, if you will, or two actually. But for the most part, the people on the board are certificants. And in addition to that, they're also volunteers. Why do we exist? Simply put, we set the standard for certification for OHS practice in Canada. So pure and simple. That's our mandate. That's why we were formed. That's what we do. We're a certifying body. And that, I'd, I'd ask you to keep that concept in mind, particularly when we get later on into the discussion. In addition to setting the standard for certification, we have two certifications. So we have the CRSP and, the, and introduced last year, we have the CRST. So those of you who are certificants, and I am assuming that's the majority here, will hold one or other, or in the case of one individual, both certifications. As a certifying body, it's important that we adhere to standards and that we can demonstrate that the process that we're using is a legitimate process. In the world of standards, and everybody in our, in our field is quite well aware of that or quite familiar with that concept, in the world of standards, a certifying body fits under the ISO standard of 17024. So we are cert ISO certified to 17024. What that means is that our processes and the systems that we have put in place meet that standard and continue to meet that standard through uh, regular audits, no different than, than if you were doing an audit on 45,000 or an audit on 18,000, something, whatever the case may be. In addition to that, we also meet the ISO 9000 standard. The reason why I mention those two points is because it's important that the certifying body can hold itself up to, sh to show that what, what it's doing actually fits within accepted norms and standards. The other point that I wanted to make sure that everybody clearly understood is that our primary responsibility and directly in our mandate is that we are here for, we're a private interest, we are here for the protection of the public. The reason why we exist is not to protect certificates, we are here to protect the public. Somewhat subtle difference, but it, it'll make a little bit more sense when we get into later into the discussion. With respect to the ISO certification, we are one of, I believe, five or six organizations in Canada that are actually certified to that standard. And from the point of view of our international peers, uh, our sister organization, if you will, or the similar organization in the United States, the BCSP, are also ISO 17024 uh, registered. So that's where we fit into that community. The larger community, which most of you will have heard of as INCHPO, or the International Network of Safety and Health Practitioner Organizations, is the international level of all of the groups like ourselves, and to a certain extent the membership bodies like CSSC or the ASSP belong, and they hold discussions at an international level to try and bring in common practices throughout the world because, um, as I'm sure most of you would agree, there's no one isolated area. In today's world, everything is, has an international context to it. Just to rehash, this is our vision safe and healthy workplaces through certification. 
So we're not interested in being a membership body. That's not our role. It's not our mandate. We're not interested in being uh, a registry college, a licensing organization. That's not our role. Our role is, in essence, to do this. Set standards for occupational health and safety pra uh, professionals or practitioners, perhaps, is a better word to use. And that's what we do. The reason why we're involved in this discussion is because this is an integral part of the overall definition of what it means to be a professional or to be viewed as a professional group. We have two levels of practitioner. We have the professional level and the technician. I've already mentioned that. We also have MOUs with other organizations within the INCHPO framework, if you will, so that a CR, our standards are reciprocated in other jurisdictions. So a BCRS, or somebody with a CRSP can apply to transfer that, that uh, certification to uh, the United States and, and go for the CSP, or uh, we have an MOU with IOSH in the United Kingdom. We also have an MOU with uh, the Safety Institute, oh, sorry, it was SIA, or Safety Institute of Australia. They just changed their name. They're now the Institute for Safety and Health, Australian Institute for Safety and Health. Um, and we also have an MOU with uh, NIBOSH in the United Kingdom. And I believe shortly there'll be a, a, an MOU signed with the uh, SIS, which is the um, accrediting body in Singapore. One point I'd like to make here is the difference between a certifying body and certification and a qualification, because that'll come up a little bit later on as well. A certifying body is basically the purpose of that group is to look at a candidate, assess their competency through various te uh, techniques, and then deem them to be competent to hold a particular certificate. A qualification, on the other hand, is something that you receive after you complete a course of study. So a qualification is, for example, the degree that you received from the university when you completed a, uh, any degree, or the diploma that you received from a college once you completed a college program. Those are qualifications. They are not certifications. So we've been around for approximately 42 years. What does that mean? What you see before you there is actually as of, uh, I believe, uh, July or August of this year. So it only shows the, uh, the certification of the CRSP. We now have, uh, I'm trying to read it here, 5,900, 5,984. Uh, active CRSPs, of which approximately 2,000 or just over 2,000 are actually practicing here in Alberta. And in addition, we also have, as of uh, about a month ago, about 55 CRSTs. And I'm not sure where they practice. They're, I think they're dispersed pretty well throughout the country. So this is the evolution of CRSP. So why does that matter? Well, what we're here to talk about really is defining a profession. So before you define that profession, you have to look at why do you have a profession in the first place? And if you go back from that, you say, well, where did we come from? And we came from a place where safety, say 40 years ago, was not really deemed to be a job per se. It was more an add-on to other duties that people performed. That has changed.
Today's world is such that you can no longer afford to be that way. Organizations need to have professional advice. They need to have uh, solid understanding of basic principles, and they need to be able to navigate their way through the various regulations and laws that are imposed on them by governments. So safety has progressed from 40 years ago to where now people have careers in safety, that it's a legitimate job, if you will. And what we're saying, it needs to go to the next step now. It needs to go to, quotes, a legitimate profession. So where do you all fit? This slide basically talks about the job of safety. For, those in the, for a person just coming out of school and want to have a, a career in safety or in occupational health and safety, what does it look like? Well, if it's going to become a profession and a lifelong career, this is what it needs to look like. It basically, there would be an entry to that process. And you come into that with a series of qualifications at various levels. You then become certified at a, an appropriate level. We're showing the CRSP version, if you will, but the same thing would uh, apply to somebody who's a, 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 an ROH or somebody who a, has certification as an occupational health nurse. Basically, the concept is still the same. You work your way through that process. You perhaps even get degrees, which now are available. What, 40 years ago, there wasn't really any around. You might even have gone further than that, and you might actually move into uh, doctoral work and research. The other thing that's key to a career is that you have to be accepting of the fact that there's a need for lifelong learning. You continually have to improve. That's not news to anybody in this room who's used to dealing with standards and dealing with audits and continuous improvement and ISO concepts. Continuous improvement is a natural part of being in a career. And there's also places for specialization of specialized certificates or specialization from the point of view of the fact that uh, health and safety unlike some of the other career paths, is, has a defined scope of practice that is extremely wide, and we have some individuals who are more, quotes, generalist, and we have some who are perhaps more specialized. And even those who start, sort of start out as generalists usually tend, up to, special, uh, tend to specialize uh, over time. So what do we have here? We have skills plus academic background plus experience eventually translates into career. So why are we here talking about this? Well, earlier this, sorry, uh, yeah, earlier this year, the CSSE and the CRSP jointly issued a survey to certificants and to members asking them about their knowledge of professionalization, did they think it was a good idea? What do you want to, you know, what do you know about it? And the results basically showed that although 70% were in favor of moving forward in this direction, the vast majority of those respondents also said they didn't know enough about it and they didn't know what it entailed. So this is why we're here. We're, we're, we're trying to have that dialogue. So what is a profession? This is the definition from our perspective. It actually comes from the Australian Council of Professions. We borrowed it from them. But I think it, in a nutshell, gives us context as to what we're talking about. So there's the concept of ethics. There's the concept of a specialized body of knowledge. There's the concept that you have to have academics to learn some of the techniques and, and, and knowledge within that body of knowledge. 
that body of knowledge evolves over time through uh, uh, research, education, and training. And finally, those who have all of that stuff then learn to apply that knowledge and exercise those skills in the interest of others. A hallmark of a profession is that it becomes a profession in the context that we're talking about here when its purpose is to better public at large or others in that sense. To translate that slide, we, because safety and health people love to have triangles, we have a triangle. So this is what makes up, from our perspective at least, this is what a profession looks like. And I'm going to go into each one of the levels of this pyramid or triangle. First, there's a knowledge base. So what is a knowledge base? Well, in our case, it's the knowledge about safety and health. That's all the skills that we know. It's the research that we do. It's the behavioral stuff. It's the processes. It's the hazard analysis, incident investigation, all of that kind of stuff. That's the body of knowledge. It's essential knowledge needed to be able to practice in that discipline. It's defined through a competency process and that competency is identified as being core to the profession. In other words, if you're going to be in that profession, these are the skills that you need to know. That should sound familiar to you because we talk about that when we talk about the examination process and things like the blueprint and the competencies that make the blueprint or make up the blueprint. There has to be an accepted theoretical basis for the discipline. You, you, you have to understand that, yes, there actually is a body of knowledge that belongs to this process and not just an add-on. So that's why it perhaps has taken till now to actually move forward with this uh, conversation as to are we really a profession. And it also evolves over time, and that's where we're coming from. So we've evolved since the BCRSP was first founded. We're now 42 years on, and the world is a different place. The next layer that was in that triangle was educational programs. An integral part of a profession means that there is a, an accepted and formal educational process to learn your basic concepts, to learn the initial skill sets that you have to have. Um, these are usually in a formal academic setting. The people that actually produce these qualifications, and this is where you get qualifications like degrees and diplomas and certificates. If you look at the other professions, it's very quick to see that one of the things that distinguishes it is that the institutions that provide those qualifications usually do so through an accredited process. In other words, they themselves are required to meet a particular standard. There's not a requirement to actually do that per se. The market dictates that. So if you look at a, an engineer or a lawyer, they graduated from a school, school of law, school of engineering, whatever. Most of those schools are accredited. And the reason for that is because graduates from that school want to have a piece of paper that's recognized by the other players in this process, like the membership organizations, the regulatory bodies, and the certifying bodies. So if your piece of paper doesn't meet that standard, then why would you actually go to this particular school or that school? The other thing is that as the discipline evolves, you start to see more and more uh, it becoming a, a valid, quotes, faculty, if you will, in the concept of educational institutions.
That leads you into a definition of role and capability. So once you've got your education, then you start looking at, well, what do these people do? What does somebody who has a law degree, what do they do? What does an engineer do? What does a nurse do? And out of that becomes defined scopes of practice. It comes career paths, and you'll go back to that first slide that I showed. In the context of occupational health and safety, BCRSP and the CSSC ha are signatories to the, what's called the INCHPO framework, the Singapore Accord. What that is is that we have said that we will move our processes towards the international standard that's been agreed to by all member organizations, the, the 14 uh, organizational members of INCHPO. And in that is a thing called the body of knowledge and the competency framework. If you haven't seen it, I'd urge you to take a look at it because in essence it, it says this is what the world, not necessarily Canada or the BCRSP, this is what the world says you need to know to practice health and, occupational health and safety in a competent manner, both from an academic perspective, from an experiential perspective, and from a uh, from a, a role perspective to a certain extent. But what flows out of that is professional and ethical models. In other, and all of you as certificants have agreed to abide by an ethical model. That's why we have a code of practice. The problem is that defining a scope of practice, particularly in a field like occupational health and safety, is quite difficult and will take a, a, a long time to evolve and, 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 uh, and actually delineate. In some cases, these things have been going on for years. Like, for example, the engineering profession has been an officially a profession around for almost 100 years, over 100 years in some cases, and they're still defining their scope of practice. So where do you go from there? Well, once you've all got all these foundations in place, the ultimate step is to actually define yourself as a profession and get recognition and professional status. This is in the Canadian context. While anybody can do all the other stuff, in the Canadian context, this is primarily a provincial jurisdiction. It's the way the Constitution is written, it just happens to be the way it is. The only caveat that is, to that is if you happen to work in a, in a fed federally regulated workplace, the rules might be slightly different. But for the most part, occupational health and safety is a provincial jurisdiction or territorial jurisdiction. So each of those would develop their own schemes. What that also means is that each of those jurisdictions set the rules, and they set their own rules, and those rules aren't necessarily the same. They may be slightly different. The government would set the rules for things like titles, a PN is a PN, or an RN is an RN, and who can use that term? What do you have to have to be able to apply to use that term and then apply for a license to practice. The other thing that the government will do is determine the scope of practice. And in some cases that may be multiple scopes of practice and it may be actually graduated practice in some cases. That's per, uh, that is actually fairly common in the medical field where you have a scope of practice that's, li if you've got one title, you're limited to a scope of practice up to, point, uh, to, to X. And if you need to go to Y, you need to have a different set of skill sets. Or a, an a, skill set A plus skill set B. This is where we are now. All the other stuff has been done pretty well. I'm going to show you that in a second. The one piece that has not been done anywhere in this country is professional, uh, professional recognition. The CRSP has license protection in the sense that it's copyrighted and you can't call yourself a CRSP unless you are, in fact, a CRSP.
but the policing of that is done by the BCRSP. It's done by the organization. Once you move to legislated titles and regulation, then the policing of that goes to another body altogether. It goes to the regulatory body. There aren't any of those yet, at least in the field of occupational health and safety per se, other than nurses to a certain extent. And in fact, as far as I'm aware, there is only one other jurisdiction right now that has full licensure, and that is Singapore. The other jurisdictions have partial licensure, for example, in the UK, but Singapore is the only place right now where you need a formal license to practice from the government to practice. The other key point that needs to be made at this juncture is that the regulatory body and the regulation and professional status will only be granted to a group if it's in the public interest. So the government will only do this if it's deemed to be in the public interest. Not in the interest of the people who happen to practice in that field, in the interest of the public, protection of the public. So like the CRSP basic mandate, there's no difference here. It's the protection of the public. And the reason why it's worded that way and put that way is because the whole idea behind granting professional status is that in return for having a protected title and a license to practice and a scope of practice, you, um, you are doing so, you're getting a right to work in that space and the reason why you're doing in that space or working in that space is to protect, it's in the public interest for you to do so. So the government has determined that it's in the public interest for these people to do it, to, to be licensed, to be, become licensed professionals. The closest analogy that I can get to that is something that I've, I've said a number of times and people perhaps might have heard me say it before. To, in the province of Ontario, for example, I'll, I'll move to a different spot. To me, it's absolutely ludicrous that you have to have a license to be a manicurist, but you don't have to have a license to be an occupational health and safety practitioner who's giving advice to an employer to protect their employees. It just does not make sense. The other thing that I, I really should point at this, uh, or make a point I should make at this stage, is there has to be wide buy-in from stakeholders. And when I talk about stakeholders, I'm not talking about the people in this room per se, or the member organizations like the CSSC, or the, the Alberta Society, or, uh, or even licensing bodies like the Registrar of Nurses. They are part of it, yes. But the larger stakeholder group is the users of the service, the employer groups. No government is going to protect or give protected status and scope of practice protection to a group of individuals without fairly large support from the wider uh, users of that service. So what was all that stuff about? That's setting the stage for what the CSSE and the BCRSP have been working on in the last year. Uh, um, over a year ago, the, the two boards met and we agreed on certain fundamental principles and one of which was that we were going to move towards trying to establish a framework for the profession. What I'm going to talk about now is where we are with that. The framework is basically here now. And now it's a, it's a question of filling in the components. A few words about the, the, the framework for occupational health and safety practice in Canada. This is a roadmap in a way. It's a, an organizational process. It's not the be all to end all and, and there's gonna be variations depending on jurisdictions and depending on circumstance and depending on timing. Not all jurisdictions are gonna be jumping into this with 
In fact, I would suspect there'll be one that will go first and maybe a year or two later somebody else will go and whatever. Alberta may well be the first jurisdiction, but I wouldn't necessarily bet on it. It might be Ontario. And the other point I should make is we're not just talking about CRSPs or CRSTs. We are talking about the larger practice of occupational health and safety in Canada. So in addition to the CRSPs and the CRSTs, we're also talking about ROHs. We're talking about uh, certified occupational health nurses. We're talking about ergonomists. We're talking about uh, specialized auditors. A lot of people contribute to this overall process. And those other groups have their own membership bodies and have their own certifying bodies. So they need to be part of this process as well. So this is what the roadmap looks like. I will stress at this point that the reason why we're filming this is so that you can actually go back and look at this again. It'll be up on the website. But we can also send a copy of this PowerPoint to anybody who really wants it. So don't worry about looking at the tiny little detail. Okay, so what's this built on? This is basically what we're saying is the foundations for a profession. You take all of the concepts that I just talked about a few minutes ago about defining the profession and you translate them into, well, what do we need to do to make it work in Canada? We believe that this is the way to do it. There are some provincial components, primarily the, the piece that talks about the regulatory body or the, the regulatory college, whatever title you want to do to use for that. But the rest of it can all work and in our view should work in concert across the country because one of the fundamental principles that we've heard back from government when we've talked to them and we've, we've had consultations with government in British Columbia, in Alberta, in Ontario, and in Nova Scotia, is that don't bring us anything that will restrict the mobility of individuals from practicing or working at any point in the country. You must have a process that can be transportable across provincial boundaries. So let me go through some of these components. This, this is not news, by the way, to those same governments because we've given this information both on the political side and on the regulatory side. So the, for example, the occupational health and safety departments, or the regulators in, in various provinces. They are all familiar with this. They, they've seen this. Let me go in a little bit more detail. One of those pillars was the National Accreditation Board. If you cast your mind back to the slide that we talked about in defining a profession, we talked about professions, uh, the universities or the colleges or the whatever that pr have the programs where people actually learn the basic skills. Most of them are accredited. We didn't have that. Now we do, or we will shortly. Um, this, yeah, I'm just, all right, this is the National Accreditation Board. Um, this, this brute, the, another one of the initiatives of the CSSE and the BCRSP when we had that uh, collaboration discussions was to work on this piece. This is now complete. It has been presented to all the educational institutions across the country that provide uh, training, so the, the diplomas, the degrees, etc. They are fully aware of it. They are working towards it and getting their systems in place. And they fully understand that at some point in time, they will need to be accredited to a standard. We've developed the standard. It's ready to go. That standard was developed with input from all of the educational institutions. 
And in fact, the target right now is that the first accredited programs will start rolling out or be accredited, sorry, the programs are there already, but the actual accreditation piece will be in place by Q4 of 2020. Academia was part of the development of that process. And as I said, that model is now complete. We're now moving into the rollout phase of that. So that's one of the pillars. And again, that happens at a national level. The next pillar. Sorry, this one ties back to accreditation. It really, um, this just re-emphasized why accreditation is important. It's basically, it then gives you a, a firm foundation on which to build your profession. You are fairly sure that the people who have qualifications, the people who have graduated from programs across the country have a, a certain defined set of skills and knowledge. And it also helps the educational institutions themselves maintain their standards and improve their standards as changes go to the body of knowledge or changes go to the accepted requirements. So one of the things that obviously happens is the programs have to keep evolving. They have to match the changing nature of the workplace and the changing nature of the practitioners within that workplace. Now I go to the next one. What's the next piece? Well, the next pillar, again, we say at a national level, is the certification process. This is already in place. We have a national certification process in Canada. It's called the BCRSP. We have a national certification process in Canada for hygienists. It's called the CRBOH. We have a process in place for nurses. So. This is national in scope, and it's already there. Nothing needs to be built. It needs to be continually improved, but it's already there. The other point I'd like to make at this juncture is certification processes by their very nature are exclusionary in nature. In other words, you have to meet a certain standard and if you don't meet that standard, you're not, you, you don't get the certification. You're all familiar with that. You went through the certification process. And, that, and for that matter, some of us who are here, shall we say longer than others, not to point fingers, um, you know, with, with that, that process, as you all well know, has evolved over time as well. So that's, that's ready to go. This piece, perhaps I should leave to last, but anyway, I won't. This piece is the piece that now needs to be developed. This is the regulatory college. The authority for the regulatory college comes from the government. In Alberta, you have a unique process because you have a separate act that deals with part of that. But that may or may not be the most appropriate way to get certification, or sorry, to get uh, recognition as a professional status. In most other jurisdictions, it's granted through an act of, you know, if the profession is deemed important enough, it is deemed uh, or it is granted through an act. So, and, and the same is actually true here in Alberta. So, for example, uh, engineers in Alberta have an act. Doctors in Alberta have an act. Lawyers have an act. They don't necessarily go through the poor uh, process, although that's certainly a stepping stone, if you will. The other point that I need to make is, um, by its very nature, it's a government process. It's government-driven. 
there's government input, and there's government oversight. All of that has to happen. But before a government will even think about doing this, they have to have stakeholder feedback. They have to have a, a business case, if you will, made to them to say why is it important? Why do we think this is good? Why does this protect the public? Why is it in the public's interest to do this? That's the driving forces behind this. The other point I'd make that this is also an exclusionary process. Not everybody is granted a particular title. Not everybody is granted a scope of practice or, or a license to practice within a particular scope. In some cases, there's limited licensing, et cetera. So this d is not all encompassing. It only encompasses the scope of practice that the government deems necessary to include in it. So there's scope and there's limitations. So I've talked about two exclusionary groups. Now we talk about the inclusionary group. The last pillar, the fourth pillar, is the membership organization. And in the case of, of in Canada at least, in the case of uh, occupational health and safety, that is the, the CSSE. Again, it already exists. We don't need to invent it, at least for the generalist piece. Some of the other specialties perhaps will have their own organ membership organizations as well, and there's nothing wrong with that. But basically, the fundamental difference between the membership organization and the other two uh, bullets that I just showed is that this is inclusive in nature. Everybody gets to become a member, for the most part, at various levels, because the whole purpose behind the membership group is to help people get to the point where they can obtain licensure. So this is why you have continuing education processes that are tasked within the membership organization. This is why you have um, mentoring sessions. This is why you have chapter sessions. This is why you have uh, uh, networking sessions, etc. That's the whole purpose behind the membership organization. And at this point, I'd like to draw a little bit of a, use that role term again, because basically I've talked about three different roles. Leave the accreditation piece aside for a minute. There's the role of the certifying body, and out of that you get certificates. There's the role of the regulatory college or licensing body, and out of that you get registrants or licensees. And then there's the role of the membership body, and out of that you get members. Individuals can, have all, can be all three. But one of the things that we feel is quite important to distinguish is that the organizations themselves are better served if they focus on their particular role. So the membership organization focuses on membership issues. The certifying organization focuses on certification. The regulatory college focuses on license to practice um, and maintaining or discipline within that license to practice. For example, once there is a regulatory college, the complaints and ethics piece tends to shift from the certifying body to the regulatory body. So there are examples where a membership organization is also the regulatory college. They have a dual role. I would suggest to you that that is an old-fashioned way of looking at it, or a, an older way of looking at it, because recent experience has clearly shown that when you do that, there is a danger that the membership functions and the regulatory functions get intermingled and overlooked, or one takes precedence over the other, and the organizations themselves lose focus. And an example of that that I would give you 
is most of you, because we're all in the health and safety field, most of you will have heard of or remember that there was a, a collapse of a mall in northern Ontario a number of years ago. There was a, an inquiry that came out of that. And part of what came out of that inquiry was a finding that the role of, in this case, it was the Association of Professional Engineers of Ontario, they had failed in their role as an oversight group. Be and they said, oh, this is terrible. And the reason why was that the finding was is that one of their licensees had failed to properly carry out their function. It was known, and the, and the regulatory body had not done anything about it. So the association then said, well, we better look at this. And they did. They, they brought in uh, a third-party consultant from the United Kingdom to have a look at how the organization was set up. And the result of that review was that the problem was fundamental in the fact that the Association of Engineers, and I would say to you the same thing is the case here in Ontario, uh, sorry, in Alberta, had lost its focus with respect to its primary responsibility of licensure. It was more focused on its role as the membership body for engineers. And as a result of that, in Ontario at least, they've now split those two roles. So there's two separate organizations. One that looks at the licensure piece solely, and that's their function, and the other piece that looks at the membership uh, requirements and needs and, and, and responsibilities. That's why we're suggesting in our model here that that's the, perhaps the more appropriate route to take. Keep the roles separate and you don't have that. To further reinforce that point, I would also point south of the border. In the United States, it's in fact the opposite of what we're talking. Instead of trying to regulate the profession, they're actually talking about deregulating professions. And if you look at the reason why, in most cases, it's because there's a general understanding or feeling that the professional bodies who are supposed to be regulating their, their licensees have lost focus on that and are not doing that and they're becoming more turf protection entities, restraint of trade, if you will. So governments are saying, ah, that's not what regulation is for. We're taking it away from you. So that's a trend that has to be kept in mind in this discussion. So that's where we are. The last slide, before I actually turn it all over to you guys, is this one. International framework, we say, OK, well, you've got this certifying body, you've got the accreditation body, you've got the regulatory college, and you've got the membership body. You can't have them all going off willy-nilly. And we agree. That's why, as we go forward this process, there needs to be the fifth pillar. And that is sort of the overarching organization that's made up of representatives from all of those four functions to help guide the profession and become the primary advocate for the profession. To use the engineering analogy again, that would be Engineers Canada. So Engineers Canada is the national body that sort of brings together all of the provincial associations. And they act as the spokesperson for the profession. So that's the fifth pillar in this case. So where are we now? Well, we've got the membership piece. We've got the certification piece. We've got the accreditation piece ongoing or pretty well, you know, moving. The last piece is the regulatory body. And that's where you come in. We now need to get gauge interest from certificates. We need to know what you feel about all of this because there's no sense in us spending all time and kinds of time and effort going to governments to say we want to become a regulated profession if you guys don't want it in that sense. But you also have to realize that it's being done not for you, but for the protection of the public. 